Hey folks, we are going to continue work on our Eberron adventure artwork tonight. So let me check my signal, make sure everything's coming through clear. Uh, I'll go through my intro spiel and then we'll get to work. So hold on real quick, checking my signal. Oh, hold on real quick, checking my signal. Sounds pretty good. All right. So let's see, let's get things prepped here for intro and then we'll dive into work. So, all right, uh, hey, uh, my name is Phil Kearney. I create uh, role-playing game supplements and illustrate them, then publish them online. Uh, currently, I focus my attention on Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition ideas. Uh, there are a slew of links in the description down below that will show you stuff that I've already published. Most of it is um, extensive free previews, enough that you can actually just reference the, the, the preview documents to be able to use them. Um, there's probably about 150 illustrations across the books that are just listed down below, um, not to mention a, a whole bunch more that are on the DMs Guild beyond that if you want to check them out. If you're just here for the artwork, check, you know, click into the full preview. You can see a bunch of artwork that I've done. You can expect more of the same here. Um, if you're a D&D &D enthusiast, then uh, certainly be welcome to check out the ideas. If you think they're cool, um, try using them in your campaign. And um, any support or donations and purchases go towards me creating more books in the future. So uh, best way to support the stream, obviously pick up a book if you like them. Uh, otherwise, um, I just posted that I'm live on Twitter. So you can follow me at Phil Kearney if you wish to be in Twitter space with us. Cheers. Uh, otherwise, best way to play is uh, support the channel, is like, subscribe, hit the bell icon. I picked up another subscriber today. Thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate the support. Um, like, subscribe, hang out with me for a while, um, and let's get to work. Hey, Hornetico, it's good to see you, my dude. Let's, uh, this is a book cover we created. We're at, where are we at? We're at episode, uh, episode 155 of this stream. Uh, we've, uh, the, like the first 140 of them, uh, were the maps for this adventure. This is the book cover we create around episode 40. Uh, beyond that, we're now making hook tokens or uh, 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 illustrations, uh, portrait illustrations for all the, uh, the, the characters, NPC, uh, the NPCs that offer plot hooks for your characters to dive into this adventure. So I'm going to restart that file because it looked like it locked up on me. We're getting really, really uh, close to done uh, with this particular illustration. So we're going to, uh, I think we're just gonna play with this one for a little bit. Um, I'm already pretty damn happy with it, but uh, I just wanna, I think I wanna clean up this lapel a little bit and then we'll be able to uh, move on to the next character. So I'm just gonna drop into here and just do some scratching at this. I'm gonna kick up my strength at the 70% so that I can, Whittle through these things. Ah. Let's do this. Duplicate. Merge. There. Now this is all just one layer. See, I can cut through it. One layer. Now I can smudge down and work on it as a single piece. So right now I'm just doing some touch-ups. Some touch-ups and clean-ups and we should be good to go. Like this guy needs some eyebrows for real, dude. Hey, Hernanico, what do you got going on today, my man? Just gonna do some of this. <laughs> I like how this guy looks. This is a great picture. And what I absolutely need to do is I need to uh, round out. It's, uh, it's clipping a little bit. So I need to actually get um, this out to probably more like that. I need to flesh out the thing properly. I'm just going to block this in. I 
black at it a little bit to rough it up and then we'll drop in the highlighting colors and then we'll be able to move on get this thing in place I'm really happy with these I like all these illustrations I like doing character art I really do it's um, I had a very low tolerance for the um, private commissions I was getting for character art just just everyone always has very uh, when you get the when you get to people that are willing to spend a couple hundred dollars on a single character illustration it's either because they're incredibly passionate about D, &D in general and, and they just want to have characters or um, they have really goofy tastes that are difficult to fulfill and they keep ratchet ratcheting up the cost uh, they're willing to pay to get whatever fantasy it is that's on their mind that they're trying to get onto paper somewhere. So you kind of got to keep an eye out for that stuff. Like, uh, am I, am I compromising my integrity by working on this piece? And I don't bother you with any war stories, but, um, those, those topics come up when you're trolling Reddit, Facebook, and deviant art for, uh, for art commissions. It's a uh, commissions is uh, freelance art is a hard gig, man. You know, you, uh, if you want to have any freedom in doing what you want to do for yourself, you really got to build up an audience that just kind of loves you. And until you get there, you're, you're basically, uh, you know, pushing pixels for somebody else's dreams. And, uh, and you need to be, uh, you need to be aware and on board with that for you to be able to, to really, uh, sell out your you know sell your skills out to not sell out your skills but well maybe but sell your skills out to others to make use of so gotta maintaining what you think is right and wrong for the use of your art and how you want to use your skills is, is actually a really important conversation to have with your heart i definitely encourage anyone that looks looking to pursue artwork as a, a means of generating income to be very very real with yourself about what makes you feel good as a person and uh, and what kind of art uh, are you willing to create and how would that fold into how you feel about yourself as a person, right? It's just something I'm pointing out. I think it's important. That looks about right. So we're gonna go with that. And we can take this here. This here. Buzzering this in here like that. There we go. Tap, 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 tap a -roo. Love that. Duplicate the layer again, conceal, merge, sally forth. All right, back on track. I got the uh, the angles now. I've got the proportions right. I got the volume good. Now I just got to render a little bit to bond it all together, and then we'll be able to kick on to the next uh, to the next character uh, sketch. But for now, what's up? Hey, not much. Uh, so I think I've made a ton of progress on. You know, hey, right on, my guy. TTRPG on the way. I hope that hits all the marks that you're looking for, my man. It is no small task to create an RPG. Like writing supplements for, for a game is relatively easy because all of the, the, the underlying physics of the game environment are already established and you're just embellishing them with gap filling, right? That's a lot, that's a lot of what I do, gap filling in the 5e mechanics and pub on DMs Guild. But um, I, have, I have not yet built an RPG from scratch. It's, it's on my plate probably for 2026. Keep an eye out for that Kickstarter, but uh, we're not there yet. 
So I'm just ramping into it. I can feel the momentum rising. I'm kind of looking forward to it. I'm going to just blend this all together a little bit in here. Pepper this with some dots. More dots, more dots, more dots. Yes, what is going on? Mouse keeps getting bumped. Knock it off, you. Knudging. Oh, I got to set a timer. I'm on a time limit tonight. I've got about an hour and a half to play. So I got a 20 minute timer here and I'll probably push it to 100 minutes instead of 90 as I do. What's going on in here? Yep. Get that bent out. There we go. So right now I'm just working on perspective. Little micro details, shifting things around, making sure that they sit pretty the way that I want them to before washing my hands of it and pushing on to elsewhere. There we go. Pretty good. I think I'm happy with this overall. I don't think I have to fuck around with it too much more at this point. I think we're pretty good. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I wanted to fix this lapel. Hold on. that down and blend that in and now we have to take how much of this do I need to grab let's see if I can get away with this Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Merge down. Pull that, just resize that a touch. Man, that cold shot I had on that resizing of the planet this morning in the uh, the Spelljammer stream was just freaking. I'm still, I'm still geeking out on that one. I had a, I had a planet and I had to resize it down to a map scale in the same picture, and the the smaller version of the uh, of the of the planet was like maybe five percent of the size of the original illustration, and uh, and I nailed it dead percentile on the just the first. You know, I made a little bounding, like, uh, like, you know, I, I did a. I did a bounding box like this, and then I just winged it down to here. And I, when I had it done, it was exactly the size it was supposed to be without checking any measurements or anything. Just eyeballed it, fucking nailed it. That is so, so satisfying to be able to just reflexively or intuitively nail your ratios perfect on the first go. Such a satisfying op um, uh, occurrence. Words, smurf, nerp, nerp. Being able to nail angles, curves, uh, resizes, references like that on, on just a, on the first go or, or without having to like murder yourself doing it over and over again. Uh, that is, um, that has the, the same, the same quality feeling of like getting a strike in, in bowling or, 
I don't know, some other sports ball metaphor. <laughs> I don't know a lot. Of, I don't know a lot of sports. I like his hair being off a little bit, though. I'm good with this. I'm good with this. I think. Uh, I think I'm pretty happy. What I don't want to do. Let's come through here and carve that. I want to see. What can we do? Let's do a let's do a masking screen on here, and uh, we'll just trapes along the edge here to straighten that out a little bit. Uh, but then we'll come through with about a forty percent strength, fifty percent, and we'll do just a little bit of a fade, uh, fade here, just to just to get that mar that edge of the bust of just to blend in a little bit to whatever page texture we end up using in the adventure book. And then we'll probably start working on Rashid. And this guy, he's going to be fucking fun to work on. God, what a grizzly monster he is. I'm really kind of looking forward to diving into that work with him. overall I don't know what I'm doing I'm just kind of experimenting but that's what we're doing half the time anyway it's rare that I know 100% of what it is I expect to do a lot of it's just a, an exploration process of just discovery improvising as we go there we go but I like how this is looking so so far so good right Don't know what we're talking about tonight. I tend to talk about I tend to talk about the state of the industry and my own uh, business efforts in the morning, especially when I'm exhausted because it's on my mind. But uh, Thursday nights and Monday nights like this ever on stream, I, I don't like talking business nearly as much as I just enjoy talking game philosophy in general. But I don't have a specific topic of conversation on my mind currently. I thought I might have something that would just drop in and I could just rant about it for an hour or so, but it's not there. Not there yet. You know what? I'm feeling a little stuffy. I'm going to open a window. You won't see it, but it'll be open. So hold on real quick. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit cooler outside than it is inside the apartment. <sighs> this will be good. Here we go. Yeah, uh, Professor Dunk, feeling pretty good about this guy. I think we're good to go here. Yeah. <laughs> nice, man. That turned out, I'm, I'm really happy with that. Happy with that, happy with her so far. Uh, I like the lighting on him better than her. It's a little, it's a little more, um, this is a little, a little, a higher degree of realism, I guess, to it. But I got no complaint about either, any of them in particular. So let's drop that out there. Let's shut that down. Um, from Hilda, we can lock. Lewis Dunk, we can lock. Blah, 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 blah. Let's get into Rahid Malign. What a great name. This guy's dope. Yeah, this is going to come through 
super sick. So let's do let's just do our our construction here real quick. Here and here, there. We we'll go with lines, line, and then we'll have another layer here, color, and reference. There. Now I gotta go fetch some references. Let's uh, let's do. What are we gonna do? Let's go with um, um, Egyptian Mafia Thug. Let's see what kind of wonderful images that may deliver to us. <laughs> not, not bad. Right off the cuff. It's a little pale. I wanna have, I wanna have a little bit more color going on here. Let's see. Finger gun suckers. There is a strikingly few images on catalog of Google for Egyptian mafia thuck. That is very, very thin. That's like 20 pictures on the entire internet. That feels wrong. Let's, um, let's see. Ooh. That guy feels pretty good. Istanbul. Let's keep it, keep it clean. There we go. Now, do we have good? Oh yeah, we got really, really good saturation here. Uh, I'm watching my RGB over here to keep an eye on things. It looks like it has a reddish tinge to it. Is that true? I mean, yeah. That guy's faded out. This might not actually be a good color reference. I don't know. That's a purple. Yeah, I think there's some. There must be some sort of red filter on that. I don't think that really. That feels wrong. So let's uh, let's see if there's something else we can. Ooh. I think that's probably a proper reference. Hold on. Let's find out. How's our array? Pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. Okay. This is good saturation. I think we should be fine on this one. Um, yeah. Let's, uh, let's just start with this guy in the center. And just uh, borrow off of his skin. Here's a mid-tone, here's a highlight. Uh, here's, uh, here's some shadow. We'll be able to pluck off this guy pretty good. What up, buddy? So we're just gonna drop a block of color in here. Just gonna start with the flesh as our base layer. And then we'll do uh, uh, color for the hair and then the suit. And then we'll start to um, work on um, lighting and uh, highlights and shadows. And then we'll merge the whole thing down and blend it together. I'll find some, um, some scar images to work the, uh, the scars in after I complete the, the actual general illustration. So I can do it as kind of like an add-on effect afterwards, but that's pretty easy to do. Flesh. Gray. Gray. Mosh me, copper. Mosh me. Okay, so we got some whites and then oh, that's a, uh, like a blue. I bet that'll work out. Dip into it. And there's my highlight there. There's my gray. Yeah, I think I'm gonna be okay with that. Let's 
So we'll start here. Was it my who? Stick with that. There we go. That eye, I just like fucking love that eye. I would make that a fake. Like, um, I don't know if uh, I don't know if anyone out there has seen the Magicians, the uh, the sci-fi TV show about magic school, college kids, and magic school saving the world, fairy tales and stuff. Anyway, uh, one of the main characters had her eye plucked out by by elves and uh, they gave her a replacement eye and they used it as a, uh, it was a scrying device. So they could, they could see anything that the character could see while she was looking. I don't, if you haven't seen it, I won't spoil it for you, but seriously, if you haven't seen The Magicians, that show is fucking amazing. It, uh, mm, amazing is not the right word. Fun. It is a super fun show. It's, uh, I would say, the, the, the quality of plot and, uh, and execution of story is probably comparable to Buffy or Angel. Um, it's not a Joss Whedon story, but it's, it's, I would say it's definitely better than Dollhouse. If you've seen Angel, Buffy, and Dollhouse, then yeah, it, it's at some place between, I'd say it's at some, some place between Angel and Dollhouse in general. So fun characters, um, the tension and difficulty ratchets up as, as the, I think it lasts, I think it was like a six season show and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's cool. It's got a lot of great stuff and, and the in jokes after a while, it just gets super good. Both fantasy TV shows and sci-fi, uh, have this sort of, this, this sort of, uh, progression that they go through. That they start off kind of like episodic creature of like monster of the week sort of motif. And as the show continues, a, a larger plot starts to emerge. Uh, and by the time what that by the time that plot is evident, like say in the second pushing towards third season, the, the characters like the actors kind of grow into each other. And they get really comfortable with being snarky with each other. And then it just becomes ridiculously silly fun because there's a, a, always a crap ton of um, in-jokes and, and history that can be referenced that, and you know, snarkiness starts to arise. Uh, I, think, uh, I think Farscape is probably the absolute best example of this, uh, like like Joss Whedon is is really really well skilled at building um, um, dialogue and uh, and character progression, and and can have those characters well established pretty much from jump. But uh, but he really is is an incredible writer. So um, a better example would be Farscape, which I think had less skilled writers. Um, at least, at least out the gate, but they did a fantastic job with having the characters evolve into, into a team or into a family that, that really gave a crap about each other, that they were able to really ratchet up the, the risk to individual characters that, that the whole party would feel threatened by during the course of the, the four seasons that, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the four seasons that the show lasted. I'm just about ready to uh, to dive into another binge for Farscape. It's been it's been maybe four or five years since I've watched it all the way through, and I think I'm about ready to do that again. That show is good. Farscape, I mean, 
but yeah, the magicians, it's um, it's it's a great show. A bunch of weird, quirky crap that happens. It's just it's fun. It's a fun show. That sits pretty nicely. Hey, what's going on with this suit? I like I kinda like that. Can we do this? Twenty minute timer, keeping time. Let's keep it going. <clears throat> so for newcomers, I'm here six days a week. Monday through Friday in the morning, I do uh, book art for the Spelljammer supplement that I'll be publishing on DMs Guild uh, on Mondays and Thursday nights, like tonight. We, uh, we work on the Eberron adventure on Tuesday, uh, sorry, um, yeah. Tuesday lunchtime, uh, we develop new mechanics for the martial powers book which is an alternate magic system available to martial type characters fighters barbarians monks rogues as well as uh rangers paladins can dip into the powers that we are developing uh, as as can artificers and uh, warlocks to a very limited degree uh, so we develop the text and the mechanics for that book on tuesday um, this book is already done, but it's going through the editing processes now. So we'll have opportunity to do layouts for this Eberron adventure once that's completed. And I'm thinking we may have that dropped to us by late October. Um, and then the Spelljammer book on Monday through Friday, that's already both completed edit, writing edits and page layouts. So we are now only dealing with creating page art for that book. And once all that art is completed, we get to publish it uh, for people to start using in their own games. So I'm really excited about that. But um, on Tuesday, we've, uh, we're slow cooking the actual text and mechanics that go into the martial power system that we've been developing. And so um, that is a... Uh, that's an opportunity for folks to, to tag in and see how that writing process goes when you're when you're basically I build PDFs I make I make role playing game supplements I, I specifically focus right now right now on fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons and it's a really great uh, opportunity to kind of demonstrate all the effort that goes into creating these supplements or books in general it's like if you're ever on the fence about like you know. Like when you see a book that has a really high quality to it, um, you'll have a, if I do my job right here, you'll have a, a good indication of like how much work went into um, high, high production value work. I, I, like to, I like to think my stuff is high production value. So cheers. Uh, but that also allows you to scale in comparisons. Like if you see like just like a Word document with Times New Roman fonts and no pictures in it, You'll have kind of an idea of what, like, how many hours may have gone into that sort of a project in comparison. So when you're looking at price points on stuff, and you're trying to think about, you know, what, where, how did we get to this point? Where did this come from? Why are they setting this? That's that's something you'll have a. If you stick around with me, you'll have a better perspective as to like where where costs come from, um, what expectations may be from the the people that are producing the books. Blah 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 blah. Just kind of inside baseball stuff. And if you were ever interested in being involved in creation. Uh, I'm kind of okay with that.
kind of like that. Hey, what's going on, Shiner? How you doing, my buddy? I'm just, uh, I'm settling into the night and inviting the muse to take control so I don't have to think about anything and just let the, let the pixels get pushed and see, uh, and see where she'll dream us to be. Here's how, uh, here's how um, um, Professor Dunk ended up. So I'm pretty happy with that result. That's, uh, that's what it's all about, man. Finding that flow state. That's the great thing about artwork is that it really invites flow state. Flesh, let's grab some. Um, yeah, buddy. That's looking real good there with that. Let's do that. Let's grab this guy. Art time is is uh, once uh, once you get to a point where you can trust your own like the, the the reflex like just reflexively paint like not really having to pay attention to what it's doing and just be able to produce uh, without having to micromanage movement like you can trust that you're gonna you know put the pixels where they belong and that that you you know done enough archers that when you when you paint an archer he's gonna look you know like she's holding her bow correctly and all that bloody blah, blah like once you get to the point where it's reflexive that's when your brain starts to turn off and um and that you get that zero point experience where you're just witnessing the production of uh of the art instead of like actively thinking about what it's gonna be i mean i contemplate my my next move occasionally but once I know the direction that it's going to go in, I can turn, like, the more I can turn off my brain, the better, like, if I, I like, at a certain point, my reflexes and, uh, and, and just training in, in art can produce better results than me actively thinking about what I'm trying to achieve. So that's what that flow state is. When, when you reach a point where it's more efficient for you to just get out of the way and just let the body do what the body th it thinks it needs to do. And if there's a flaw, you can, you know, learn to course correct it. But after a while, you kind of figure out your own style and the way that you do things. And if it looks good, then you don't have to really be too critical of yourself. The, the criticism for most artists come in anywhere from one hour to like a month later after you get bored with the piece and, and you stop you know being happy that you finished the thing without killing yourself that's that's when you start noticing like you have to take some time to get you know to come down off of your high because there, there's a there's a definite massive dopamine release that occurs when you acknowledge that a piece is finished and uh, and it's that it's that that self-induced drug state that you gain from the satisfaction of job well done that uh, that has its own addictive kind of property to it so you have to come down off of that high of of the work that you've produced for you to be able to have an honest critique and that's when you can start becoming self-reflective and like well the next time i do this x y and z and you know if you journal and stuff like that you can you can track that sort of stuff i should journal i should be tracking that sort of stuff but i don't so cheers um, I'm happy with the, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that suit layout. This is just, this is just going to turn out a okay. I can, I can freaking feel that right now. Super basic. Doesn't need a lot of, uh, doesn't need a lot of small detail attention. So, um, we're just, uh, we're just going to dive in and start working on the, on the lighting. God, we could knock this guy out as soon as today. So let's go in here and drop some highlights on you, buddy. Good enough. There. Yeah. OK. 
God, that eye is, I love it. I keep geeking out about that eye, but I'm really looking forward to, to doing the scars and, and the deformity there. The, uh, the druid in my campaign during, uh, during first level, they, um, they ran into a, uh, a squad of orcs. Uh, there's, there's a, a, a tribe of orcs nearby in the starting village where they're at. And, uh, and they, and they asked, uh, using druid speak, they, uh, they asked for the team's help that they had, they had problems with unwelcome guests in uh, in their forest and they asked the team to help them and the team said yes that they, they'd be willing to help they were they were scared they were going to get killed so honestly they they allowed themselves to be bullied into accepting the quest and um and so the 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 druid uh the the orc uh, the orc shaman they were talking to uh was explaining that it's um it's a it's a problem with the fey and the spirit realm, and so they would need they would need a spirit's blessing to be able to see the uh, the, the creatures and the entities that they were that they were um, trying to expunge from the forest, and they asked if the team that they asked the, the the shaman specifically asked the druid in the party if uh, if she wanted to. Um, to receive uh, a, a blessing to uh, that would allow her to see the fey that were infesting the forest, and she said yes. So the uh, so the shaman stabbed her in the eye with a sharp finger and tore her eye out, and then so she has this bloody empty socket, and then she and then she rubbed the blood. Uh, on her third eye, and then her eye lit up with a red light, and she became uh, she became a priestess of Grumpsh, and she didn't realize it. <laughs> so she basically she she basically um, took a pact uh, of Grumpsh, and she uses uh, she uses warlock spellcasting instead of druid spellcasting. She's level nineteen now, but um, but it was a, a really great way for me to uh, to terrorize well to terrorize her because I took her eye. But on top of that, I modified her magic. She'd never played D&D &D before, so she didn't know what to expect anyway. So, and so I was like, yeah, you're, you're, you're using pack magic now. And so she didn't even really know what that meant. She's like, okay. She was just mostly traumatized that, that this orc walked up and tore her eye out. And as a result of it, when she lost her eye, she now has permanent detect magic and ethereal vision. So she can always, she, all she has to do is, is just take an action to focus concentration and she can perceive any magic that's within, you know, that's that that's within vision, that's within the line of sight. And then any anything in the spirit, like in the ethereal plane or spirit world, she can also see. And uh, as the level, as the characters gain more levels, they found uh, ways for other characters to get access to that information, so they could see what she sees. But for like the first ten levels of the game, she was the medium through which most of the spirit creature interactions were were conducted through and it was fun it was a lot of fun this it's a great team they're all brand new to fifth edition one of them played second edition back in the day uh but hadn't played anything since and uh and the other players had never played D, &D at all so it was a real privilege and joy for me to be able to have uh to be their first dm and uh and not to break my arm patting my back, but I, I gotta say, I, I've, I've really spoiled them because the very first campaign they ran has gone from level one to 20. And um, it's, it's the best campaign I've ever built. It's, it is by far my best campaign, my best, my best work. And, uh, and it's just been an absolute blessing to, to be able to, to take these guys through this through this campaign it's just it's just awesome it's at 19th level now so it's kind of swirling down to the to the conclusion of it they're still running around tearing stuff up trying to figure out how to save the world it's great <laughs> it's super super great
fix that. Definitely not a cold. <laughs> Grumps, man. You don't screw around. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to rely on shadow here because these highlights just aren't hitting it. Uh, they aren't giving me the amount of um, contrast on the characters I, I really want. So we're gonna have to lean into. Like I said, we're gonna have to lean into shadows on this one. God, look at how gnarly this guy is. He's so fucking awesome. Like, if this is your handler, you should really question the choices that your character has made. This guy should not be handing you quests. I just... I don't feel... I, I, I just... Something disturbs me about that. Like, don't, don't take quests from this guy. He probably doesn't have your best interests in mind. Look at that. So, those... The very, very subtle highlights there, but we're gonna stick with those. We're gonna get in here and grab some deeper dinge. We'll start darkening this down, defining the, the pockets, and then we'll have a, we'll grab, um, we'll grab this, this crease here for the deepest shadow. And th that lip color looks pretty good too. I can use that. Text! Hey, Vivi, what up, my dude? Classic discerning of spirits, vision of the planes. This is normal. It's, hey, it's just a D&D campaign, man. If you aren't using all the tools in the toolbox, you're leaving adventure on the table. And of course, I use color mana. And even though it's an Eberron campaign, it's, uh, I, I, always use, I always use color mana. It is my default paradigm because it's really, really fun to be able to use like literal colors as a narrative tool in magic. Like my team, my team knows what to expect when I tell them that like they, they run across a ward and it's coated in um, white and black magic. They, they know that there's warding coming off of the white and that there's gonna be some sort of necromantic or curse effect off of the black magic. So it just builds, just using the Magic the Gathering color, color schemes and of course I use color mana with my with my characters so they they have all their their gear and you know every everything is is built around color so it, that's the that's the language of magic in my campaigns and so they can they can lean into it and you know pick the colors that they want and, and use those to express themselves and, and how they want to describe and depict their characters like our our rogue with with um blue and, and black magic and uh, and our ranger sporting uh mostly red and green magic our our druid is mostly uh green and uh and blue magic it's a fun little team fun little team and there's text popping off over here what up hey kid how you doing my guy When, when I was in the hospital, they kept drawing blood from me because they had to, they they were they were checking where the infection was at and how things were coming along. They were doing cultures and stuff like that, and then none of them none of them knew who Mitch Hedberg was. Uh, but he had this he had this. If you don't know who Mitch, Mitch Hedberg is, he is a he's dead now. He OD'd, but God, it's he was so fucking funny. Um, my the the reason I bring it up is because. Um, uh, he had, he did just like a shit little like little one liners, stuff like uh, stuff like I, I find that uh, Duck's opinion of me is largely based on the amount of bread that I have, you know, like stupid little quippy stuff like that. And and one of his little quips was, "Don't get your blood drawn by Doctor Acula," and, <laughs> and so I kept saying that to all the help that would come in that was that was drawing blood off of me and 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 it, it, none of them had ever heard that joke so i got to use it over and over and over again and just make all of them fucking laugh it was great but mitch is awesome man he was so funny he's like i'm in my hotel room between shows and i'm waiting to go on to the next city and i think of a joke and and like he holds up a stack of papers like yeah i gotta write it down but i don't have a pen or a pad of paper nearby so either I have to go find a pad of paper or I have to convince myself it's not actually very funny. 
<laughs> he's just anyway. He's it's his. He just like rant. He just like rattles off one liners like that for like forty five minutes, and that and at some point, it's just overwhelming. And once your brain starts breaking down, all his shit is just fucking hysterical. It's so great when you uh, when because he he has all these recordings of live audiences, and. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so he'll start off with like a little bit of momentum and he has like this awkwardness to this and and people like might might laugh here and there and he's like, Oh you guys don't think any of my jokes are funny and then he'll like then he'll like start kicking through a bunch of papers like I gotta get the better material quick, I'm gonna lose you guys. And so he'll like dig through his book and he'll get to the back like towards the back end of his like we'll, we'll go back around to the front later on. <laughs> and so He'll just move further into his routine, and uh, and then he'll and then he'll keep it up. And at some point, at some point, something he says catches somebody in the audience, and they start laughing. And then from there, like everyone just starts falling down like dominoes, and everyone just starts really just getting into his humor. And it is so fun watching him do like a forty-minute set and just watch him turn the audience and then just make them end up loving how. Stupid! All of his jokes are. They're really great. It's just, it's really really great. Um, Mitch Hedberg. He has a lot of content here on YouTube, and and bless him for for having been here. He's gone now, but um, God, he was so fucking funny. Just just gloriously brilliant. Anyway, the end. Reach down. Text. Text is everywhere. Uh, the mana stuff uh, just looks so much more fun to tinker with than the standard stuff. Uh, trying to talk to my current DM for Wednesday to let's tinker with it. Nice. Well, I mean, you can look at all my books for free if you want. They're they're all online there for you. You don't have to buy them to use them. They're like 98% of all my mana books are part of the free previews. So if you, you know, want some mechanical direction on that sort of stuff, you can you can poke through my stuff and lean into it or or use it as a jump off point for yourself as much as you want. But I love, um, the, what I love the most about it is it forces casters to make decisions. You can't, you have to, like, if you lean into like, I mean, you could just use a narrative, like just generic spell points or spell slots. And then just say that you're like, if you're like, say if you're Golgari, which is like, um, black and green magic, right? You could just use spell slots out of out of the player's handbook and just describe the magic that you use as either green or black or a mix of it, and just create your own sort of narrative signature for how you how you're creating magic. But if you want to really challenge yourself and nerf down your spellcaster, uh, which I think is a great way to help bridge the divide between marshals and casters is that um you actually adhere to the banner the to the the here I'll, in case anyone doesn't know it i'll waste everyone's time here and rant about my own shit here for a minute dm's guild and then we go to uh tap untap burn and here's the array of books that i have uh, here's some of my artwork that i did um, actually, what I want to do is click into that one. Five star, five reviews. Happy about that. Uh, here's the bundle. And in the bundle, there's the uh, the revised five color mana spell list. And this is free, of course, if you don't want to pay for it. it, uh, it, it your choice. Uh, but um, this, is, this lays out the basic tenets of how each color works. Um, the basic aspects or mechanics that go into each of the colors, damage types that are associated with each color, and between the aspects and damage types, that's what leads us into the color magic um, layouts. Like acid is black and green magic. You'll find that's pretty consistent across magic cards. Blade Ward, it's a warding spell. Of course, it's going to be white. Chill Touch, Necromancy, of course, that's going to be black magic. Um, you could like uh, you could contest with me that compelled duel is a very passionate thing that should only be red, but black is manipulative, and I find compelled duel to be manipulative magic. So in my mind, it could be either blue, uh, it could either be black or red, but this allows you 
So and, and if you if you actually you know buy these things, the entire spell list um, here I'll show you. Uh, what I include in all the books if you buy them is the master expanded spell list, which has all the spells. I also like this literal document. Um, I break it down by Ravnica. I break it down by Strixhaven. Um, the Artificer, Bard, Cleric, like all the classes have their own unique spell list and it's current for everything. Um, all the books. So all like 700 and what all its spells are, are published. They all have, they all have their uh, color signatures. And, and I also, but you have to pay attention. Like if you don't use my, my concentration mechanics, the durations that I have listed here are specifically for the way that I use concentration. Um, if you're going to use uh, normal durations out of the player's handbook, then ignore this duration list because it'll lie to you. Um, like for instance, if we go if we go up here in the ninth level spells, like um, um, actually, let's go to I'll get back to work here in a second. I just wanted to point this out. Uh, all spells. Here we go. Let's just go to all spells and let's kick down to nine. Uh, Foresight, for example. Foresight in the player's handbook lasts eight hours. In my system, it is a concentration spell. It's ninth, but you could also cast high magic, sixth level and higher. You can cast it a number of times equal to your max spell level minus five. And at 19th level, you get a 10th level spell slot. And the only spell that is 10th level is Wish. And it dives into the mechanics about that if you wanted to use that stuff. But if you do... At 19th level, you have 10th level spell slots, and you would have five spells per day that you can cast of 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th level. Or you could just cast like five 9th level spells or five 6th level spells, but you only have 80 mana at 20th level, and a 9th level spell costs 9 mana. So you could churn on um, Foresight, but that'll give you a DC of 19 on your concentration check, and every time you make a saving throw, any saving throw, and that counts against your con uh, against your concentration. So the flexibility of being able to use spell points and having that fluidity of like, I can cast like 30 fifth level spells a day if I want to. Well, yeah, but if any of them maintain concentration, if I hit you with a strength saving throw and you've got a minus two in your strength saving throw and you're sporting a fifth level spell and your DC is 15, you're gonna have to roll a 17 on your strength saving throw or you're gonna lose your spell. And there's also mechanics about like, since there's no set duration, you get exhausted after a while. You get tired of maintaining the spell. Like one of the examples is like, if you read a book for over an hour, as an example, that's like a moderate saving throw. So like you have like a, like a 12, uh, it, you would have to make your concentration check like every hour if you're doing research in a library, trying to like, if you're studying a spell and like you have spells maintaining to help you get like borrowed knowledge and foresight and stuff like that. You can ramp up your you can ramp up your skill check, but you have to weigh it against the concentration check that it, we call it attrition. That over time you have to keep making checks to maintain concentration. And if you fail your concentration check, you could choose to just spend the mana to keep the spell up and running, or the spell gets burned and then you'll have to spend the mana again to cast it again. But like if you're at the bottom of the ocean and you lose your water breathing spell then you can just choose to spend points to keep the water breathing active so you don't drown, right? So th there's, there's different ways that you can take mana away from characters so that they're constantly being, having their, they're having their spell points attacked like their hit points are attacked, but kind of like on a different plane. So anyway, that's some of the ideas behind that. But, uh, and then the, the mitigating factor is since all these spells are different colors, you can, you can either have a very wide pool of like only two or three points of mana in each color. And when you run out of color, you run, you can't cast that spell anymore. So it's, it's like, do I want to have a broad set of spells that I know, but I have to break up my mana pool a lot and potentially lose access to whole chunks of spells at a time. Um, or do I want to, uh, or do I want to hyper focus on spells that are already devoted to the color that I want. Like if I'm Golgari, I'm gonna do a lot of black and green spells specifically because I have that color mana available to me. And then the third option is research and studying, finding books, scrolls, 
or sages that know how to, like, say, cast blue spells using black mana. So you could study under someone or do research or find magic items that will let you steal a spell from one color and devote it to your colors. So over time, you can build out a spell book or, or a set of prepared spells that are like one color. And now all I'm working in is green or all I'm working in now is black. And your goal from level one to 20 is to try to get your mana pool to line up more efficiently so you can pull off more magic. And that's kind of like a, it's like a self nerf, you know, but it really leans into the narrative of what color magic can really be about. And then when you run into traps, like you can, like if you're doing like, uh, like, uh, in, uh, like investigation checks or, or like um, detect magic, uh, you can like see little string. Uh, and some of the examples in the book that I use is like, uh, like a, a, a box that has white magic on it. So, you know, it's warded. So then you take an extra check to try to explore the black magic or the, the white magic that's warding it. And, uh, and you can see that, uh, that there's, uh, a, a, there's a little haze of blue that's concealing an illusion. You can see the blue magic, but you know, it's hiding something from you. But like, unless you roll like a 23 on your investigation or your arcana check, you won't see the black symbol that's hiding underneath the blue magic that if you open up the chest, it'll, it'll make you take a, a constitution saving throw. And if you fail it, you stay asleep until the person that set the trap comes along and decides that what they want to do with you. It starts off as just a, 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 a box that has obvious white magic on it. You don't even have to have magic vision to see it. It's like, this thing's warded. We better investigate that. So then you can dive in and start exploring what the colors can do. And, uh, and like I said, you can set traps or, or like, um, like a basilisk that can turn people into stone, for instance. Um, it's, um, its eyes can have like this unnatural red glare to it. Like red magic is, is stone based. So like just, you just, oh, it's such a, it's such a fantastic narrative device. It's, it's just, it's so infuriating that, that Wizards owns both of these IPs, but they, they just, they just, they could, they could get people interested in magic by, by using D and D magic to describe color. And, and you could get more people from Magic the Gathering interested in D and D if you actually use the color mana system that they love as individual characters. Like you, you could play Teferi. Here's your, here's your blue stats for your time wizard. Here's the stuff that he can do. Oh yeah, and if you spend three mana, his his prestige class or his you know his his subclass is the fairy kit. Like if you spend six mana, you can um, like uh, banish a creature or something like whatever. I don't know whatever whatever the planeswalker cards do. You can borrow off the planeswalkers to create different boons, magic boons in D and D. You know, and just assign them a mana cost in a color. And then, like, you know, you could have uh, a whole bunch of, um, um, like, uh, Asherak, uh, or, um, sorry, um, Asherak, yeah, um, have, uh, have, like, a bunch of blue and, and black mana effects that, like, he specifically has access to. Or, like, Chandra, uh, she's, she's core red. So you could have, like, a, a, like, you could make her a sorcerer and then have a bunch of meta magic feats that key off of her red mana. So, but I, I haven't published the, the the color mana sorcerer book yet. It's it's um, I'll 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 put that out after I finish the Martial Powers book, and of course the Martial Powers book is a hundred percent free preview on the uh, on the playtest. So you could build like a like a Rakdos barbarian and uh, and assign all the all the mana in his in his fury pool to be black, red, or both. And then of the five disciplines, like you can make exploits black, uh, reactions red, maneuvers black, strikes red, and then like sustain powers could be both black and red. So you could spend either color if you want to sustain a power. Uh, or if you like want to lean into exploits specifically, then you go black heavy, right? It's that sort of thing. That's, that's the flexibility of the system. And it's just, I don't, I am, I just feel blessed to be the one that thought of it it's just it's so fucking good it's so good i i have not seen 
anything out there on the internet. I've been looking for years to see if anyone has ever come up with anything close to it. And, and as far as I can find, no. There's there's other sloppy mana mana pool options that aren't, in my opinion, as elegant as, as the simplicity that we found with this system. I had to rewrite that book. My editor, Hitting Dave, he's like, I love what you're trying to do, but this is dog trash. So I need you to rewrite this entire book if you want me to be your editor. I need you to simplify this, this, and this. I need you to resolve these mechanics. I need you to make color more fluid to use. Like he flat out just refused to work with me unless I rebuilt the book. So it took me nine months to build the book. And then I brought Hitton in and he's like, yeah, no, this is garbage. You can't do this. You, ha- you have to change this and this and this and this and this. Go change it. And, uh, and I followed all of his advice and I just, I just fell double in love with what I, I knew it was going to be a good system. But the, that's the power of a really good editor to be really, really honest with you about the quality of work that you've produced and be able to understand what it is that you're trying to achieve but be able to be able to say, look, this isn't going to work mechanically. Here's your problems. I need this isn't my book, and you're only paying me to edit. So my advice to you is go back and fix it and come back. Most real, straight up forward conversation I've ever had with anybody, and God, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. So uh, I don't know. Tip your staff. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, I'm i just I am. I geek out over this mana system stuff because it's just, it's just, I am, I am honestly proud and humbled that it, that I'm the one that penned it. I just, it just feels like a blessing. So anyway, check that stuff out. If you don't know what I'm talking about, the stuff is, again, it's, it's all extensive previews across all those books. And, uh, and if you key into my Martial Powers project on Tuesday, you, you can literally use the color mana system for all 13 classes together. And the multi-classing is fluid. It's super fun. And, and more so than anything else, it's, it's, forcing, it's, it's, it's how it forces you to, uh, to make decisions about how you want your character to play with power. So that's what I love the most about it. Anyway, I'm ranting pretty hardcore here, guys. So don't mind me. Let's uh let's steal this. He seems pretty pale. That's a good one. Color Man is so, so cool. Such a fanboy for that crap. Let's do that. Let's push that up a bit. Some more. Love this guy's eye. It's just ick. Um, okay, so uh, I need to I need to deepen the shadows a bit more. This I can afford to thin the color on that a bit. Good. And now there's my eyes and teeth. Let's keep those on top. Let's grab that darkest color. Let me catch up. I was monologuing. Level go spreadsheet, yeah, man. And that, that's the great thing about it. It's editable. So if you ever disagree with any of my decisions, just change it. And, uh, and, you can just, and you can just pluck the spells that you want and then drop it into a separate spreadsheet so that your character's keeping eyes on it. Um, I, have, uh, I have a stack I bought from Chessex. Uh, I, um, uh, a stack of, uh, of, oops, I lost you. Hey there. Uh, D6 dice, like here's my, D, here's my blues. And here's my white, and black, oops, give you the right side, there you go, black, and red, 
in green. I bought uh, I bought a hundred and what a hundred and twenty of each of these. Uh, no, I spent one hundred and twenty dollars buying um, buying ninety uh, ninety mana for each color. So because uh, a um, um, a full caster like a sort like a wizard uh, cleric druid they cap at eighty mana. So I have more I have more colored d sixes. Than, um, than I need to have a 20th level character. <clears throat> and it was, it was fun buying all, I just, I just honestly, I just like having a shitload of, of dice. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. So that way you can have a stack of dice and you can just grab a wad of it. It's like, yeah, yeah, here's five mana. Let's just throw a fireball at somebody. <laughs> but you only need like one, only need one red mana and then the rest of the mana can be any color that you want for you to be able to throw a fireball at somebody. Um, so it's, it's like super simple. It's, it's very, very flexible. But if you only have like four points of red mana and the rest of it's green, then when you run out of those four points of red mana, you're, you're, you're borrowing off of your green pool, like one from red, and now you either have to eat more red or borrow off of your green pool to be able to fulfill like the three mana that you need to be able to throw a third level spell. One red plus two, whatever. So everything, all, like all the symbols are like red and then two, you know? So it's like, it, that's a third level spell. So um, it's possible to be able to dive into deeper specifics. There we go. But um, let's do that. I did something. Eh, fuck it. Let's just bone these down. We know where we're at. And then we'll just add in this dark here. But yeah, I didn't want to get more complicated than a single color because it's it's already so restrictive. It's it's such a departure from what normal 5e games are. I, I don't want to give too much culture shock. Just just having a color identity bound to spells and like when you're out of red, you can't throw a fireball anymore. That alone is like massive culture shock to a, to a, a 5e native. But it's, it forces you to make a lot of tactical decisions as its own kind of mini game as a caster. And like the simplicity of being a martial character, not having to deal with that stuff means a lot more using these systems. There's also an elemental system in the elemental key book, uh, which is, uh, you know, earth, um, uh, air, earth, fire, water. And it works the exact same way. Uh, earth spells, fire spells, water spells. So if you run out of water mana, you can't cast any more water spells. Run out of earth mana, you can't cast any more earth spells. And uh, if you're if you're playing the avatar, then you could have a blend of all four elements. If you're playing a normal bender in the uh, in the world of the last airbender, like if you're an earth bender, then all you'll have is earth mana or earth key, and uh, and you'll only be learning disciplines and spells that are devoted to earth or you have to study at different at different um, temples to learn different techniques and learn how to adapt them to your particular elemental uh, um, your your devoted element so there's a lot of really great depth that can be in there and there's some there's some neat uh, airbender I like like avatar bender ideas out there but again it's I, i've never seen anyone even attempt to, to actually make mechanics out of the elements like that so it's i don't know i don't know why they don't exist i don't know why i'm the one that did them but it makes me incredibly proud that i was the first to market with those kind of ideas so very very proud and that's that was my that was my first um self-produced project and, it, and it's not done yet. It, there's, it's just Spelljammer is a higher priority right now. Um, just because it's, it's more marketable. There's more people that are interested in it. And, uh, you know, and when I got my mitts on it, it was like this, we need more. <laughs> it needs more. So that, that began my quest to, to build out. Ship mechanics. Sorry, I'm falling, I'm falling into this piece here for a minute. Really, really digging it. God, I love this. 
Thanks for uh, thanks for giving me something fun to rant about because I fucking love that shit. But yeah, I love using color man in all my games. It doesn't matter what the setting is. Color is so freaking dope. It's just it's literally what color is the magic that tells you so much about everything. It says so much without having without having to provide a lot of exposition. You just get it. When you see, you know, when you see a knight on a griffin and he's just absolutely pumped up with red and black you know, like like red and white magic. You you know you're going to get a Boros sort of vibe off of that guy. He's going to be like a paladin, holy warrior type guy as opposed to uh to a, a knight that you're running in, in, uh, across on a battlefield that's just steeped in red and black magic. It's like, "Oh, you, uh, I have no guarantees that I'm going to be able to have any kind of an accord with you at all. <laughs> so it's, it's, it, you can, you can come to, you know, you can have your own biases based on the colors and what you, what conclusions you draw from them. But that's something that the DM can build into the narrative space. Like you, like you can learn to not trust black and blue mana characters. Like they're, they're always trying to stab you in the back. That's, that's what Demir is all about. There's so many fun things you can do with it. Like I want to do a I want to do a hex crawl campaign where each hex is devoted to a different color, and uh, and if you if you um, uh, if you attune to that hex while you're in it, you can regain all of your mana of that color on a short rest instead of a long rest so if your team uh has a lot of red and you're in a mountain and you're in a mountain area or if like you're in a, an artifact uh like an artifact facility or something that's that's determined by narrative to be devoted to red like it's a red land you can um, you can juice up on red mana and get it all back quickly because you're attuned to the mana in that land. But as soon as you leave that, but that's not your destination. You have to move through that hex to somewhere else. So in that kind of a game, the team would be looking, like would try to be getting a, 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 a high view to see what, the, what the, the terrain around them is like. Like there's some, there's some swamp off that way and it bleeds off into a lake. And on the other side of the lake, there's a glade. So that's like black, blue, and then white mana on the other side of it. Like, what does our team have? Our team is green, white, and blue magic. Well, great. That's a great direction for us to go in. We'll have to mitigate the swamp. But otherwise, we'll be able to juice ourselves up a lot. So me as a DM, I can hit them with more challenges that'll help exhaust their pool more quickly. Because they're, if they're going to attune to those lands while they're adventuring, and then if they find a dungeon, dungeons are black. So if you have black mana, or if it's devoted, like if that, if the dungeon's like a temple devoted to, a, like say, um, uh, Erebos, for instance, then then you're looking at in that instance black mana as well. But if you can identify like what the what the purpose of that location is, then you can ascertain what kind of color it will grant to you if you if you attune to it. So if there's a dungeon you want to delve into and you can attune to the color that's in that hex, then you're going to have a lot more resources available to you when you delve into that dungeon. You'll have you'll have more battery power for you to be able to push further. And then they'll have like that that hex. It'll naturally attract creatures that are of that are devoted to the same color. Like in, in the red hexes, you're going to run across more giants and and goblins, for instance. Uh, as opposed to like if you go into a blue hex, you would be potentially running across like merfolk or like changelings, mimics, um, stuff like that. So there's there it's still a work in progress, but it's one of the projects I envisioned myself doing on the DMs Guild. But I, again, we don't know what the DMs Guild is going to do to creators, so I don't I don't know if I'm going to stay and and play in their space long term or not. But if I do. That's the kind of stuff that I, I would be building and publishing there. If I don't, if I can get enough followers on Patreon to, to make it something I could do anyway and, and pull profit from, then I would. But I don't know. I don't know where we're going with it. I don't want to talk business. But, uh, but those are some of the things I've been thinking about. There's just so many. Just, just the color identities alone mixed in with the 5e mechanics is just... 
endless play space, just endless. So I'm really, really excited about all that crap. Anyway, end rant. There's my flesh. Let's go back to the suit. Open this up here. Elemental, color magic. You can also do, uh, you can make any kind of paradigm that you want. Um, another one is like a, is like a light and shadow uh, where, you, where you only have two color, where you only have two uh, aspects of magic. It's either shadow or light. So all your spells are split between those two concepts or a combination of both of them. Um, there's, uh, you, could, you can even get silly like hammer, rock, scissors. So like you have you have three aspects of magic, hammer, rock, and scissors. So like what what type of magic is this? This is hammer magic. So it's great. You better have some hammer mana on you. You know? It's just it's it there's the the mechanics work the same regardless of what paradigm you're using. It's just what narrative do you want? And um it's a it's just a really good core mechanic, like as a variant mechanic in general. Uh, all the flavor that goes on top of it is just a matter of how much how much effort do you want to invest in expressing the paradigm that you think is fun, like uh, like um, body, mind, and, and spirit. For instance, you could have spells split between body, mind, and spirit. So like confusion would affect your spirit, while charm might affect your mind, suggestion might affect your mind, uh, but like hold person affects your body. Haste affects your body, stuff like that. You can break the spells down into those three categories of, of, of being for yourself. And, uh, and martial powers is such a liquid system because you can, you just, you, there's five paradigm, there, there's five disciplines of power and you just arbitrarily decide which of them are which color you want. And if, I mean, if they're all going to be the same, if they're all going to be the same aspect, then they're effectively just like, normal key with that flavor that narrative flavor we were talking about earlier like you know i don't i'm not going to have black mana or green mana but when i throw my spell slot i could express it as black or green mana if i wanted to like you can do that with martial powers if you want to and like in that like body mind and soul paradigm you're just throwing one color around but you're thinking in those three elements but like you could you could have like um strikes are devoted to to body and exploits are devoted to mind uh, maneuvers and reaction like reactions could be body but like maneuvers could be soul and then like sustained powers could be all three of them so you have a reason to have three different types of of uh, of mana but like if you don't use exploits then you then you don't need any mind mana at all you can focus all your attention on body and soul for instance, like if that's how you wanted to play it. But then the player next to you could say, no, I, I want exploits to be body. And as long as everyone's agreeing how many aspects are in your paradigm and how to divide those paradigm, th those aspects between the disciplines or, um, or the, the list of magic, you can go with any paradigm that you want. It's just color for Magic Gathering happens to be the coolest. So I, I think Disney's uh, our Lorcana has six colors, I believe. I don't know anything about Lorcana yet, but I think it has six colors, but you can only use two. So you could build characters specifically that only use two colors using Lorcana. And that, and then you're just basically playing like a Golgari or a Rakdos character with just two colors. It's just as easy. But I mean, you could do Esper, you know, like with three color, like wedges and, and um, wedges and, uh, and, and uh, uh, shards just as easily if you wanted to go with three color mana like that it just depends on you know what game are you playing how you, wh what are you narrating and what do you want to and how difficult do you want to make it on full casters anyway rant i'm gonna f i'm gonna drop that opacity to fade it out just a little bit there that feels better peshmir afghan we're going to call that 
Afghan. Trim. Base. Let's go into our base and create some effects going on in here. Where are we at? Nine o'clock. I could potentially, I'm not gonna get it done tonight. Nah, 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 nah. It's not gonna get done tonight. We're gonna make progress, but I don't think I'm gonna actually finish it. We're gonna, we're probably gonna save finishing this for Monday. But our navigator that we're working on in the morning, that is coming along very well. I had a, I had a chance to take another look at it just to assess our progress. And I am loving how that illustration is turning out. That is a great piece. There's some really fucking great art in that Spelljammer book. I am very, very proud of that work. It's it's a pain in the ass how much production there is going into it. But like everything else that I built, if it's not a pain in the ass, it probably wasn't worth doing in the first place. And it'll end up looking fucking awesome. So it's worth the effort. It's worth the time. And technically, there's no deadlines other than the ones that I placed on myself. So there's... Um, any pressure I have is truly artificial. And it's mostly just, most of the pressure I feel is excitement because I troll the, uh, the, the um, Discord, the, the, the Spelljammer Discords and Reddits. And, uh, and I just absolutely, I get excited because I keep seeing questions that I have answers for. And I try to explain them, but it's like the book isn't published yet. So I can't just say, hey, here's the, here's the preview. Go check out page 36 in the preview. If you think it's cool, buy it, you know? I, that's where I want to get to so I can start helping people answer the questions about how to run a Spelljammer campaign because I, I, that's, that's why I built the book. <laughs> it's the whole point. I want to help people. So, but I can't, I can't really, like, it's kind of difficult to say, hey, if you swing by while I'm streaming bring up the question and, and I'll run off. I'll, I'll do, I'll do a side tangent with you and, and walk you through the process. So you get it. But, uh, but when the book publishes, you'll have access to all that stuff yourself. You can play with it and then make it all available as a free preview so that, you know, if they can't actually afford it, but they're passionate, go for it, dude, get access to it. You'll pay me back when you can afford it because people keep buying my shit. Obviously it's true. Like if you have the option to just steal the whole thing and not pay me and you choose not to, it, it probably means that you actually value it and you want to encourage me. And that's, that feels really, really amazing. Really, really amazing. Like it's, I was questioning if that was the right thing to do and it has absolutely been the right thing to do. Infinitely proud of, of just being able to bring things to the table for folks. It's just, it's an amazing feeling. Which makes me further addicted to fifth edition because it's such a flimsy system. There's this, this kind of this mantra that I have that you need good rules so that DMs can make good rulings. If your system doesn't have enough rules for the, the narrator to be able to um, intuit what... A, like it, it might not be a good answer, but if it can be a consistent answer, then it becomes a good answer because you're presenting a consistent result that the players can start to rely on as this is how physics works in this fantasy universe. And because we understand this is how the rules work, we can afford to invest our interest in it and learn how to basically exploit the system, make it your own, learn how, you know, learn tricks and trades of how to make the world work for you because that's what adventurers do. That's like the essence of adventuring. It's like like puzzles and traps and tricks and stuff. Like all that stuff is is pushing your brain to try to, to get a, not only to get over an interesting narrative challenge, but it also helps pull the, the players further into the environment. So they get more excited about being in your space, being in your in your narrative headspace. They, they start investing in you as a storyteller. And so if you can provide rules that makes it easy for the storyteller to be able to build that fabric, 
all all you're doing is just benefiting the people that are are planting their flag that this is their hobby it's like great let's reward you let's give you really kick-ass tools that let you pull off the things that you want to pull off and and i love again i love how flexible 5e is the only problem with d20 in general when i say 5e is the best system i really mean that just d20 games in general are just super flexible but i i tend i i sometimes lose focus of that and just say 5e is the best and but in reality 5e 5e is really really strong the problem is that the company that created isn't a good steward and i, I don't like you know i know I, I know i can safely punch up when i say things like that but the problem is is that there's this fifth edition i i don't think they expected fifth edition to blow up like i did uh, what i think they were expecting was that they'd build a good new version that would bring all the people that bailed on the ip on DD as a product when fourth edition didn't jive with what they felt like how DD should feel so i think 5e was kind of a, a hail mary hope that all the audience that they lost would come back i don't think they were actually trying to pursue new players at all but then the game exploded and they're like shit all these people are playing our game this is amazing but they never built the infrastructure inside the game rules itself to really be able to teach uh, teach a brand new dm how to be a dm like everything about 5e kind of assumes you've been playing the game since third or even second edition and that you just get how to play and that you just decided to play 5e instead of whatever it was that you were doing before you played 5e and i just i mean they would never admit to something like that it's just the way that they design things it's almost like they're just constantly nodding to like these these neck beards old school gamers like me the old guard that knows all of this shit backwards and forwards and just needs to see what spin does 5e put on it okay i get it. i'm good to go because that's literally how it is. It's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I get this. I'm good to go. And then I'm just going to make up all my shit anyway because I'm, I'm better at it. <laughs> modesty aside. All modesty aside. But that's, I think that's the core problem with 5e, which is what, which is what compels me to keep building for it. Because I've got this sick white knight syndrome in me that I just want to help new gamers fall in love with what i fell in love with so they get it so they fucking get it you know and um it's just uh 5e is an awesome system it is just the most unfriendly system for newbies so i keep wanting to build mechanics that are like the this these are things that you can do like you probably haven't thought about this this sort of an idea try this out you know, like that's that's how I want to build the game. That's that's the stuff that I build because I just want people to, to 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 take ownership of the game, like not feel beholden to what's in the rule books, but understand that the rule books are trying are poorly trying to teach you like how to be a DM, right? Like what you can do. Like these are all suggestions. Throw a whole book away and run in your own direction, but understand why you're doing it. That's the most important part. Do what you want but understand why you're doing it and definitely understand what kind of an impact is going to have on play or perception at your table amongst your players because they may not get it and they have to they have to be able to understand it and you have to be able to build it so that it's it's friendly to them so that it's inviting that they want to stick around and invest in you and invest in your idea of, of storytelling because they'll they'll leave 5e for ball you know for Baldur's gate 3 if they're not ha if they don't have a team if they don't have a player they don't have a table that counts on them showing up but once they once they have that you know that 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 sealed team devotion to each other that's when you lock in a player for life it's it's not just i'm adventuring it's now if i don't show up the paladin's not going to be on the team this week and and people that want to have that value that when i want to feel that importance among their friends they'll keep showing up just to make sure that the team does well anyway that's me ranting. I can change it. Of course. We all said that, though. We all said when we saw it, we can change it. Hey, Jeffrey. That's, but that's just the reality of it. 5e is like the ultimate toolbox for people that already know how to play D&D. &D. It's a great system. 
can't draw while watching stuff because I get too distracted, but I am working on some music. Awesome, guy. I'm glad. Uh, I like it so much better. Uh, you have a resource you can burn instead of just, well, bad luck means I'm screwed. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm really hard, far behind on my notes. But uh, yeah, super freaking fun stuff. Where am I? Ah, oh, this is where I'm at. Let's do this. Well, you know, this, this whole channel is kind of a study hall. Listening to, a, <laughs> I guess, listening to a, a, the, the professor rant because he knows you're stuck here. You guys aren't stuck here. You can leave anytime you want. But, uh, but that's when I, when I listen to my own stuff occasionally, I'm like, God, I just, I just kind of tear. I just get on a tear. <laughs> I act like I have, I have tenure and they can't get rid of me. <laughs> But I mean, I've I've been playing for I've been running games for thirty six years. So I mean, I have a lot of opinions about what I think works, and uh, and occasionally I'll hear something new or something will catch me at an angle I hadn't heard before. But I, I've been around the block a lot, so I've, I've got a lot of ideas about how tables flow. I think more about um, team dynamics. And and what what rules do I need to implement to uh, to to fit where the team is at, or like what kind of time do we have? Do we need to alter mechanics so that we can move through flow faster? Do I need to have a more procedural process on a round by round basis so that I can make sure I keep pushing the ball forward, so we can hit the narrative points I expect to during the session today? Like what's the size of my table? How many people do I have playing with me? How much am I? How how much is that going to lag? Any decision making that needs to be had. Like these are all things that need to be respected. And until you've honestly, until you've crashed and burned 30, 40 campaigns and and figure out what the hell you're doing wrong, you're going to keep stumbling into those mistakes. And the the more you have the opportunity to to, to fuck up. The, the less likely you are to do again. And that just that's what makes you a strong DM. You get better and better at being able to see what's coming down the pipe and know what solutions are going to work to resolve them. But until you have until you have the opportunity to just keep fucking up and learning what how you can make it better using your narrative voice, then you're just you're just learning from other people, but you're not accumulating your own experience. So hopefully the stuff that I rant about if you're newer to running games or playing D and D, you can you can walk away from something I, I ramble on about for thirty minutes and get your brain rolling about a sense of scale or or like when do players like when are characters so powerful that the players kind of have to make the decisions in the campaign like like I, I had that I had that diatribe about um, the differences in scaling uh, through the different tiers of play from level one to twenty. Uh, that was that was um, last was that last Thursday? I think it was last, a week ago. Yeah, but hopefully the stuff that I put out there gets people thinking about like these these are these are important these are these are important. You have to be able to you have to be able to process these things and know how they're going to affect your table if you want your table to survive. Like that's the most that's the most important part is keeping your table alive. And keep people coming back, because there's there's a million ways a campaign can crash and burn, um, but the one thing that's going to keep the campaign up and running is is going to boil down to how well are you paying attention to what your players enjoy and what are they looking for, what what kind of cathartic release are they actually looking for in portraying? As, are they just do they just want to be part of a team and make a difference? Because what they have in their life doesn't give that to them, and they're desperate to be important to somebody, so they they can adopt their D and D table as their surrogate family that that they um, that they that they hope the other players will learn to depend on them, or do they have a job that enrages them and the emotional their where they're at emotionally is that they need to rage and hurt things. 
but they're, they, they have enough emotional intelligence about themselves to know that the game is a safe place for them to be a murder hobo. So the DM has to, you can't shit on somebody like that for being a murder hobo. You have to, I've talked about this before, you have, you have to be able to understand where they're coming from, what they need. And if you can build a game that allows for murder hoboing, you're helping them not hit somebody in the future or, or get drunk because they aren't processing things properly and potentially keep them from hurting somebody behind the wheel. It, it might not be that holy and righteous in reality, but if you're identifying as, as, the, as, as the manager, like the DM's the manager of the table, it's just because you're calling the shots, you're setting the narrative, they're listening to you by just the nature of social creatures the dm is the de facto leader in any conversation involving dnd so um, the more you can understand what your where your players emotional states and, and like how do they work with others and like how much attention do they want versus how much would they prefer to fade into the background like if you can if you can get good at reading that stuff you can really become important to the people that you're playing with. You become you know, like they they value you and the game and the players in the game, and it becomes important to them. And that's magic. That is that is real, real magic. Anyway, that's a that's a rant. Cheers. But that's what you get after running, you know, 40, 50 tables over the course of 30 some odd years, you know, not, not to brag, but I've got a very, very long history of, of observing these dynamics. What really made me interested in role playing was how, um, how much people wear on their sleeve who they are. When they're role playing, you can re like all my best friends are are gamers and who I've played D and D with, who when they had the option of being anything, their idea of of heroic fantasy was helping people that needed help, that they had the ability to do something for, and that's how they choose to portray themselves as fantasy heroes in a game without consequences. I've had other players that, that were murder hobos. They had rage issues. They needed to deal with it. I was happy to help them. And as long as they remain respectful, they're at my table. But they didn't become lifelong friends that you know I would fly across the world to hang out with. Some of them I did. Some of them are still my best friends. Some of them I still game with online. So it's... it's um, you, you can't really understand how valuable that is until you're blessed to be able to fall into that you know so anyway that's my rant there, clean that up <laughs> that looks pretty good i think uh i think i can i think i can effectively bond, uh, bond this all down so we're going to duplicate this layer and we're going to merge this layer. See, now it's just a single layer. Uh, it's 9.23. How much time do we have left on our clock? We still got seven minutes. So I'm gonna do cleanup. I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna just do the periphery and get rid of all the, uh, all the, the, the scratch doodle marks. And, uh, and then we'll let it sit. And so when we come back, we'll do, uh, we'll blend the, the line art into the, uh, uh, into the form and finish off this piece. And that means that when we come back, uh, we'll be able to start working on this burly beast. And his name is Sethu Solga. He is of the gatekeepers. He is an orcish druid. And if he is your handler, he sends you on this mission to destroy the manifest zone in Karnathi. Uh, his circle of, uh, of gatekeepers will uh, perform a ritual to amp up a tree stride spell that will send you either into the forest 
outside of the manifest zone so you can so you can skulk your way in or if uh, if the dm doesn't plan on spending multiple sessions like more as a one shot um they can uh, the, there's a there's a, a possessed tree inside the manifest zone that's a landing point for people that specifically use solga as their plot hook and uh, so as soon as you land in the manifest zone you're immediately attacked by this possessed demon stream kind of like poltergeist how poltergeist eats timmy like snatches him out of his bed and eats him that's uh that's uh that's kind of what you walk into like that's your first that that's your first encounter it's like you just you just came out of this tree and now it's trying to eat you and there's no way back so glhf sucker and then and then it's just you know kill everything or you know negotiate with everything but in the end they, they give you this little stone and if you flick the stone into the nexus where the ritual is being performed that stabilizes the manifest zone it uh, it becomes a gate seal and gate seals are basically 10 foot by 10 foot five ton blocks of magic sigils that just go crunch just drop and basically puts a, a giant plunger seal onto the that manifest zone so you would permanently destroy the manifest zone there in Karnath. And if you wanted to make a campaign out of it, they can send you to different points around the planet to have similar um, scout missions to find the next manifest zone and shut it down before it causes trouble. That's one of the, that's one of the, you know, where do we go from here at the end of the book? Like expanding the adventure or uh, to sustain a campaign, do X, Y, and Z. So there's a, a lot of different things that you could do. So it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. But yeah, don't get your blood drawn by Dr. Acula. That's, uh, that's where we started. See, I brought that back around. Clap back. This guy's just. <sighs> and we're just cleaning up the edges, and then our timer will pop, and then I'll be done for the night. And then I'll be back tomorrow morning, and we'll continue work on the navigator. So. If um, anyone that's lurking out there that's new to the channel, hey, we do this six days a week. Typically in the mornings, Monday through Friday. Saturday morning, I do commissions and personal projects. Monday and Thursday nights like this, I'm doing Eberron art. Monday through Friday morning, I do Spelljammer art. When the Spelljammer book is done, we'll start doing Eberron art in the morning instead. We'll do Marshall Power. We do Marshall Powers development on Tuesday. Once the Eberron book moves forward to Monday through Friday morning. That opens up my Monday and Thursday night to do uh, Marshall Power stuff. And I'm pretty convinced at this point that it's probably either going to be Monday or Saturday that I, um, that I run a, uh, a hex crawl using Marshall Powers to play test the low end. Like my team, my team's 19th level. We've been using Marshall Powers since 12th level. So I'm pretty happy with what it does at high levels, but I need more experience running it at low levels to make sure that it, it feels as good um, as I suspect it's going to. It, it works great at high levels, but you have a fuck ton of mana. So of course it's going to feel awesome. You're a god. You're running around, you're smiting shit with Mjolnir and stuff. It's, it's pretty fucking cool. But, um, but at the low levels, your supply is very, very limited. So I need to make sure that there's enough resources there so that you feel like you're gaining value from, from the abilities, but not so overwhelmingly present that, you're, that you're, uh, the characters are skewing uh, um, expectations for the levels that they're at. So playtesting is important. And like I've talked about before, designing at fourth tier and then... Uh, degrading it down to first level. Like if you start at 20th level and build something that's cool at 20th level and then deconstruct it so that it can curve down to first level, then you've, you've got something that works really well for you. 
Like that's like, like in the color mana system, that's what got me into whenever you take a short rest, you can switch all, all the color of your mana, as well as when you take a long rest, you get all your mana back and you can reassign all of your colors. When you take a short rest, you don't necessarily, like wizards and druids can, but most classes don't get any mana back. Well, the monk, but most, the warlock, but a lot of classes, some classes don't get their mana back on short rests, but all classes can reconfigure the mana that they have. So like if you're a cleric over invested in blue and red magic to fight stuff, and now the green mana or the white mana is running too thin to be able to support the healing, take a short rest. Now you've got a reason for your long rest resource characters to be begging for short rests because like, I think I can lean into black and red mana for the next couple encounters and um and if we and we do okay then i can afford to take that rest and then we can dip into like we can keep the black we can dip into white and green instead so we can flesh out what we need like again that's that's a mini like a like a a deeper depth of mini game that casters get to play using this color mana system because the resources matter and it's and it's flexible so they can switch things up as they need to but they have to devote the time to do that so it, it rewards understanding what your character is doing and developing roles in your party that complement and, and support each other so you know i know i can lean into white and green magic because um our our barbarian is going to be able to, to tank stuff and has some taunt and goad features that he can he can trigger to make sure our backline stays clean so I don't have to burn a bunch of resources on a fucking shield spell so I can save up my mana to make sure that I've got like the, the, the divination magic that we're going to need when we get to where we're trying to go to the research in the first place. That kind of idea. So, and that was my timer. So technically I'm supposed to be done, but the muse isn't letting go of me. She wants to play just a little bit more. So I'm letting her, I'm on, I'm on overtime now. So it's up to the muse to decide when I'm done. And when I'm done, she is just going to leave me and it'll be time for me to, to, to get some sleep because channeling her is exhausting. There we go. I'm pretty happy with that. Nice. Like how that's sitting, gal. Thank you. Nice. God, that stuff is so fucking sick. There we go. Just about done. Let's grab some of this dark up here. Let's peel at his lip a little bit. That would like a hyena. I tell you, this guy, God, what a gruesome guy. I think he does it on purpose. Like, you could have healing magic to take care of this kind of crap. He keeps it on purpose. You know he packed a bunch of horse hair into these wounds when he got those cuts. Like, these things are street credit. We are just about done. All right, there it is. Uh, it was Da Vinci, I think, that said. Uh, no, it was. Um, I 
um, yeah, it was Da Vinci, uh, that you want to, I think it was Da Vinci. Um, the, anyway, the statement is, um, stop when you want to go so that when you've rested and you come back, you immediately pick up the excitement of where you left off. So you want to dive in. If you finish when you want to stop, you have to find a reason to start again. So if you always stop when you want to go, you're always going to want to keep going. And that's a way for you to be able to keep tunneling through the, the, the fatigue. Like uh, using that tunnel analogy, uh, I am like in my, uh, my Spelljammer book, I'm about probably like a month and a half of, of artwork left to do in the book before sealing it up. And that means I'm so far into the tunnel that I can't see light at either end of it. I am in the black. And I'm just kind of feeling my way through the book right now and just trusting that I'm going to end up on the other, other end of it. And I know this because this is the third time that I've gone through that tunneling process and, and get lost. And this is where despair lies. And the first time it hit me, I didn't understand what was happening to me. I was just getting depressed from the fatigue of constant pressure of daily production. And since I didn't understand where it was, I thought there was something wrong. And I ended up through paranoia, making it a bigger issue than it actually needed to be. Right now, I can feel that again, but I know what it is. And I know what's at the end of the tunnel. It's a book that I'm gonna be proud to be ranting about like this for years to come. And that's, where, that's the reason I make books. So I, have, I, I can point people to cool ideas and say, try these things. So I know what the end result is going to be. I just have to have the courage and the faith to be able to push myself to get through it. I don't have to break my neck. I don't have any specific deadlines. It's all volunteer work, but I have to remain focused and intent on what the end goal is so that the, the dopamine drip works at those different layers. And maybe I'll, maybe I'll talk about dopamine a little bit more uh, next time we stream. So this was a fantastic night. I hope that everyone else had as much fun as I did because I just, this was, this was exactly what I needed tonight. My heart really just needed to be able to, to be creative and, and just kick the shit around a little bit with some friends. So I really appreciate you guys. Uh, I'm going to check out of here. If, uh, if you're lurking and you're new to the channel, welcome to the mix. Um, we're at, God, what is this episode? Uh, we're at episode 155. Um, so, uh, we probably have, uh, we probably have another 200 episodes of this before the book is done. Like seriously, probably another 200 episodes It's going to be fucking insane. So I'm really glad that we're going to be moving forward to doing this Monday through Thursdays so I can start collapsing those time frames a little bit more, make this my major project instead of the Spelljammer book. Once that Spelljammer book is off my plate, this project, this Elbron project is going to explode. So, um, thanks a lot guys. Um, yeah, thanks a lot RP. And uh, good night, Shiner. Uh, great to see you guys. And um, thanks for sticking around, man. Dr. Acula. <laughs> Mitch Hedberg. Seriously, um, here, hold on real quick. I'll, I'll, um... Mitch Hedberg. Guy is fucking hysterical. Here's a 43 minute set. Best show ever. Live audience. I think he. I think this is the one where he's bombing in the beginning, and he just completely turns the crowd around. It's so freaking great. He's just, he's. We were blessed to have him on the planet with us. He's so fucking funny. Anyway, I will see you guys. Some maybe I'll see some of you guys in the morning. I'll see everybody on the other side, regardless of when that is. Um, thanks a lot. I'll see you later. Bye.